file 5. The Queen became so fond of my company that she could not dine without me. I had a table placed upon the same at which Her Majesty ate, just at her left elbow, and a chair to sit on. Glumdalclitch stood upon a stool on the floor near my table to assist and take care of me. I had an entire set of silver dishes and plates and other necessaries, which in proportion to those of the Queen were not much bigger than what I have seen of the same kind in a London toy-shop for the furniture of a baby-house. These my little nurse kept in her pocket in a silver box, and gave me at meals as I wanted them, always cleaning them herself. No person dined with the Queen but the two princesses royal, the elder sixteen years old, and the younger at that time thirteen and a month. Her Majesty used to put a bit of meat upon one of my dishes, out of which I carved for myself, and her diversion was to see me eat in miniature. For the Queen, who had indeed but a weak stomach, took up at one mouthful as much as a dozen English farmers could eat at a meal, which to me was for some time a very nauseous sight. She would crunch the wing of a lark, bones and all, between her teeth, as though it were nine times as large as that of a full-grown turkey, and put a bit of bread into her mouth as big as two twelve-penny loaves. She drank out of a golden cup, above a hogshead at a draught. Her knives were twice as long as a scythe set straight upon the handle. The spoons, forks, and other instruments were all in the same proportion. I remember when Glumdalclitch carried me out of curiosity to see some of the tables at court, where ten or a dozen of these enormous knives and forks were lifted up together, I thought I had never till then beheld so terrible a sight. It is the custom that every Wednesday, which, as I have before observed, was their Sabbath, the King and Queen, with the royal issue of both sexes, dine together in the apartment of His Majesty, to whom I was now become a great favourite. And at these times my little chair and table were placed at his left hand, before one of the salt-cellars. This prince took a pleasure in conversing with me, inquiring into the manners, religion, laws, government, and learning of Europe, wherein I gave him the best account I was able. His apprehension was so clear, and his judgment so exact, that he made very wise reflections and observations upon all I said. But, I confess, that after I had been a little too copious in talking of my own beloved country, of our trade and wars by sea and land, of our schisms in religion and parties in the state, the prejudices of his education prevailed so far that he could not forbear taking me up in his right hand and stroking me gently with the other. After a hearty fit of laughing, asked me whether I were a Whig or a Tory. Then, turning to his first minister, who waited behind him with a white staff near as tall as the mainmast of the royal sovereign, he observed how contemptible a thing was human grandeur, which could be mimicked by such diminutive insects as I. And yet, said he, I dare engage these creatures have their titles and distinctions of honour. They contrive little nests and burrows that they call houses and cities. They make a figure in dress and equipage. They love, they fight, they dispute, they cheat, 
they betray. And thus he continued on, while my colour came and went several times with indignation to hear our noble country, the mistress of arts and arms, the scourge of France, the arbitress of Europe, the seat of virtue, piety, honour, and truth, the pride and envy of the world, so contemptuously treated. But as I was not in a condition to resent injuries, so upon mature thoughts I began to doubt whether I were injured or no. For, after having been accustomed several months to the sight and converse of this people, and observed every object upon which I cast my eyes to be of proportionable magnitude, the horror I had first conceived from their bulk and aspect was so far worn off, that if I had then beheld a company of English lords and ladies in their finery and birthday clothes, acting their several parts in the most courtly manner of strutting and bowing and prating, to say the truth, I should have been strongly tempted to laugh as much at them as the king and his grandees did at me. Neither, indeed, could I forbear smiling at myself, when the queen used to place me upon her hand towards a looking-glass, by which both our persons appeared before me in full view together, and there could be nothing more ridiculous than the comparison, so that I really began to imagine myself dwindled many degrees below my usual size. Nothing angered and mortified me so much as the Queen's dwarf, who, being of the lowest stature that was ever in that country, for I verily think he was not full thirty foot high, became insolent at seeing a creature so much beneath him, that he would always affect to swagger and look big as he passed by me in the Queen's antechamber while I was standing on some table talking with the lords or ladies of the court, and he seldom failed of a smart word or two upon my littleness, against which I could only revenge myself by calling him brother, challenging him to wrestle, and such repartees as are usual in the mouths of court pages. One day at dinner, this malicious little cub was so nettled with something I had said to him, that raising himself upon the frame of Her Majesty's chair, he took me up by the middle, as I was sitting down, not thinking any harm, and let me drop into a large silver bowl of cream, and then ran away as fast as he could. I fell over head and ears, and if I had not been a good swimmer, it might have gone very hard with me, for Glumdalclitch in that instant happened to be at the other end of the room, and the Queen was in such fright that she wanted presence of mind to assist me. But my little nurse ran to my relief and took me out, after I had swallowed above a quart of cream. I was put to bed. However, I received no other damage than the loss of a suit of clothes, which was utterly spoiled. The dwarf was soundly whipped, and as a further punishment, forced to drink up the bowl of cream into which he had thrown me. Neither was he ever restored to favour, for soon after the Queen bestowed him to a lady of high quality, so that I saw him no more to my very great satisfaction, for I could not tell to what extremity such a malicious urchin might have carried his resentment. He had before served me a scurvy trick, which set the Queen a-laughing, although at the same time she were heartily vexed, and would have immediately cashiered him if I had not been so generous as to intercede. Her Majesty had taken a marrow-bone upon her plate, and after knocking out the marrow, 
placed the bone again in the dish erect as it stood before. The dwarf, watching his opportunity, while Glumdalclitch was gone to the sideboard, mounted upon the stool she stood on to take care of me at meals, took me up in both hands, and squeezing my legs together, wedged them into the marrow-bone above my waist, where I stuck for some time, and made a very ridiculous figure. I believe it was near a minute before any one knew what was become of me, for I thought it below me to cry out. But as princes seldom get their meat hot, my legs were not scalded, only my stockings and breeches in a sad condition. The dwarf, at my entreaty, had no other punishment than a sound whipping. I was frequently rallied by the Queen upon account of my fearfulness, and she used to ask me whether the people of my country were as great cowards as myself. The occasion was this. The kingdom is much pestered with flies in summer, and these odious insects, each of them as big as a dunstable lark, hardly gave me any rest while I sat at dinner, with a continual humming and buzzing about my ears. They would sometimes alight upon my victuals, and leave their loathsome excrement or spawn behind, which to me was very visible, though not to the natives of that country, whose large optics were not so acute as mine in viewing smaller objects. Sometimes they would fix upon my nose or forehead, where they stung me to the quick, smelling very offensively, and I could easily trace that viscous matter which our naturalists tell us enables those creatures to walk with their feet upwards upon a ceiling. I had much ado to defend myself against these detestable animals, and could not forbear starting when they came on my face. It was the common practice of the dwarf to catch a number of these insects in his hand, as schoolboys do amongst us, and let them out suddenly under my nose, on purpose to frighten me, and divert the queen. My remedy was to cut them in pieces with my knife as they flew in the air, wherein my dexterity was much admired. I remember one morning when Glumdalclitch had set me in my box upon a window, as she usually did in fair days, to give me air, for I durst not venture to let the box be hung on a nail out of the window, as we do with cages in England. After I had lifted up one of my sashes, and sat down at my table to eat a piece of sweet cake for my breakfast, above Twenty wasps, allured by the smell, came flying into the room, humming louder than the drones of many bagpipes. Some of them seized my cake, and carried it piecemeal away. Others flew about my head and face, confounding me with the noise, and putting me in the utmost terror of their stings. However, I had the courage to rise and draw my hanger, and attack them in the air. I dispatched four of them, but the rest got away, and I presently shut my window. These insects were as large as partridges. I took out their stings, found them an inch and a half long, and as sharp as needles. I carefully preserved them all and having since shown them with some other curiosities in several parts of Europe, upon my return to England, I gave three of them to Gresham College, and kept the fourth for myself.